President Nixon once had a very high profile meeting with the Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir. He spoke about a lot of security, top secret information. Then halfway through the meeting, Golda sighs and she says, oh, you have no idea how hard my job is. So President Nixon says, Golda, I'm the president of the United States of America. I'm the president of a hundred and million citizens. What do you have? Six million citizens in Israel? Like, what's the big deal? Golda says, you might be the president of 150 million citizens. I'm the prime minister of six million prime ministers. Many of us hopped on this bus says Nissan for Bringen, you know, to try to have someone else get us inspired. I know that's what I sometimes do. You know, there's a Yemen the Praga, Yitzvat, Yitzvat Pislev. I'll turn on the Zoom, maybe plug in my ear pods. Meanwhile, I'm checking my WhatsApps. I'm hoping for like a bit of inspiration to kind of like happen to me. And so what I want to do is turn that around back to you all and say, we are not here to inspire you because that would defeat the entire purpose of Chatzchat Nisan. The entire point of Chatzchat Nisan was whoever was saying, I am not a president of citizens. I'm a prime minister over prime ministers. In the sense that I'm not here to be your, your elementary teacher who dictates notes to you anymore. I don't want you saying Mashiach anymore. The Rebbe says, say we want Mashiach now, I'll want Mashiach now. The Rebbe says, do this, I'll do this. That's not enough. The whole point of Chafchas Nisan, which came as a shock to everybody, was now it's your turn to figure it out. I'm not doing it anymore. And when I hear from certain Chassidim, I heard one Chassid describe Chafchas Nisan, the Sicha of Tzot HaFas Arkandaz, as like as shocking and, and almost like traumatic. Like, right? you're, you're dropping us. Like now we're gonna have to do it on our own. But the whole point of Chafchas Nisan is enough nibbling at inspirational bits that someone else is putting into your ears. Enough parroting what you're told to do. I'm told to do this. I'll do this. It's time to make the project yours. It's time to take some initiative. Not just do some spit back. You know, when you're a little kid, Thomas Alpha, Thomas Alpha, basic questions on the test, spelling, matching. But as you get older and more mature, there's some higher order questions, higher order thinking. And that's kind of throughout the many, many first years of the Nisiyas, the Rebbe told us, and the Rebbe said this Nisa, and the Rebbe said that Nisa, and then Kate upset the point, and the Rebbe said, okay, you know, you're not riding the bike anymore in training wheels. You're, you're, you're not going to keep having me dictate, so to speak. I'm encouraging you to get inspired. You want me to say why you shouldn't be jaded and why we have to hold strong and how to hold our and strong. Chav Chas Nisan is about you figuring it out. Chav Chas Nisan about, is about you owning it. Not just being a passive recipient of someone else's inspiration. That's pre-Chav Chas Nisan days. Chav Chas Nisan An An is about how are you identifying your belief in Mashiach for yourself, how you're getting your mind on board, your heart on board. Come to your own answer, learn, question, dig deeper, work hard. You ever saying, stop caring about this because I'm telling you to care about this. It's like the story of the Chassid who came to the Rebbe and told him about this young man, David, that he was being Makar. And the Rebbe asked him, does David have a beard? So what do you think the Chassid did? He went over to David and he said, David, the Rebbe said you have to have a beard. And of course he grew his beard. And the next time the Chassid excitedly went to the Rebbe, he said, oh, you know, David is growing a beard. The Rebbe said, is it his beard or is it my beard? Whose beard is it? Whose Yiddishkeit are we living? Whose yearning for Mashiach do we have? Is it are we mimicking and copying only the Rebbe's desire for Mashiach? Or does our own personality get it? Or have we opened the book or figured out a way that it makes sense to us? 
And it's scary. It's much easier to be on safer ground. It's much easier to go bowling with the bumper pieces. And in the beginning, when you bike ride without the training wheel, it might be shaky, but it's time. And, and this is the era that we're in now. That Mashiach is not anymore something that we're going to be doing in a copy-paste way. The Rebbe wants us to put our own creativity into it, to, put our, to stamp it with our own personality. How can I get myself to want Mashiach? Like a self-starter. How are you going to light that fire within? Not how are you going to get someone else to light your fire? There is a story of a woman who came crying to the Magid of Chernobyl. She didn't have children for 10 years. And she came pouring her heart out. She said, please give me a bracha for a child. And the Magid said to her, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And she was crying and crying. And she said, but it is known that anyone who needs anything should come to the Magad of Chernobyl and they'll get a bracha. I'm sorry, I can't help you. After the woman left distraught, the Magad God, I couldn't help but say, a bracha? A bracha? Would hurt? Why, why couldn't you even give a bracha? The Magad said, you will see. A few months later, the woman came back to the Magad. And Baruch Hashem, she was expecting. And the Magad asked her what happened. And she said, when I walked out and I saw that you didn't want to give me the bracha for a child, I turned to Hashem and I said, Hashem, even the Magad like of Chernobyl can't help you. She went to the bathroom. Sorry, we even the Magad of Chernobyl can't help you. Now the timer went off. Please got hand me a child. And the Magad said, trick. that was exactly what I saw. Yeah, just just, you her. thought the Rebbe was just going to do it for her. you. I'm just on 4%. I, The Magid said, I saw that you thought that the Magid, that the Rebbe could just do it for you. I needed you to realize that you needed to have that firm trust in Hashem. That the bracha of a tzadik only helps when you know where the source of the bracha is. So of course we need the Rebbe's help. And of course we tap into the Maisha within and the Maisha the generation. But it's not only relying on the Rebbe anymore. It's putting in our own effort like the story of Yekusiel Lefkoe, he describes about himself that when he was the age of 40 years old, he was already learning Hasidus first by the Alt Rebbe and then by the Mithil Rebbe. He was learning Hasidus for 15 years. And yet, when a young, newly married Mashpia, 15, 20 years younger than him, passed through his town and started sharing some of the Mithil Rebbe's Hasidus, Rabbi Kassil felt like he didn't understand a word. And he told one young Mashpia, please, could you stay and teach me? And this Mashpia stayed for three weeks and tried to teach these concepts of the Mitzvah Rabbi to Rabbi Kassil. Rabbi Kassil wrote, he felt like a block of wood. He couldn't understand it. He's 40. This guy is 15 years younger than him. And he, he burst out crying and he said, I'm traveling to Lubavitch, to the Rebbe. He traveled to the Mitzvah Rebbe. And he, he, he could maybe understand a little bit of what the Mithil Rebbe was saying. He looked around and he saw a kailo full of 50, 60 young men that understood the Mithil Rebbe. And he, and, and he for sure couldn't understand the Mithil Rebbe's explanation. Again, he started crying and he stayed there for four months, carving, putting effort until that Tishrei, he said he felt like a new person. Light shone through him and he was able to understand some of the Hasidists that the Mitzvah had taught. And the Friedrich Rebbe actually brings an example of this and says, Rakan, desire, can actually change your kaychas. He went from the, having the ability to understand things like a block of wood to really understanding things. Your intellectual ability can be expanded from what you, the natural ability that you have if you so desire. So our ability to want Mashiach, to get into it, to understand everything that's coming, if we really want it, and we put in that effort, we're going to get to it. 
But it was kind of like Chafchas Nisa and the Rebbe saying, Chassidim, put in the effort. We're not going easy anymore. It's not going to be you come, you know, you hear a sikha of the Rebbe, you get inspired and it's over. I want you to take that sikha and learn it and harp and break it down and, and, and see it in green and red, like Malki said, but to really use your intellectual abilities and make it yours. And the Rebbe didn't only say this to men, the Rebbe said this is for everybody. Men, women, children, whoever you are. Now, this is also the idea that we see in the last mimer that we got from the Rebbe, the last country that we got at it, the Asif Tassava, which is a mimer that, you know, as many times as we learn it, we need to learn and get reminded again. This idea where it's not anymore that we get the, the luxury of things happening automatically. We have to put in the effort. So just to review the Mimer in short, it says in the Megillah that the Kibel Hayyehudim Es Asher Hechelu Lasas, that during the time of Purim, the Yidim, the Kibel Hayyehudim, they accepted what they had already begun doing by Matan Taira. By Matan Taira was Hechelu, they began accepting the Taira. And by Purim, they really accepted it and really internalized it. And the Mimer says, really, this is pretty incredible if you think about it. Contrast what was going on by Matan Taira and by Purim. Matan Taira, the Yidim were on a very, very high level in terms of the light that they were getting. Ani v'loy malach, Hashem himself revealed himself and took them out of Mitzrayim. They got the 10 Makais. What, the, what a ship has saw by Kriyat Yamsa, right? that Yecheskel never didn't even saw. They got so much revelation of Matan Taira. Purim time, they didn't get all these Giloyim. There wasn't, God was not revealed to the Yidim. They were in Gullahs, they had challenges, they went to a party. And when was it more real? Purim time. That's when they really internalized it. And the Rebbe said, you know why? Because when it came to Matan Taira, it was external. Hashem picked up a mountain over their head, and said, if you don't accept this, I'm dropping it. And even if you understand that according to Hasidus, that it wasn't a physical mountain, it was that the Yidin were so like blown away by the love and light. It was like, how could you not accept the Tyre? It's like, if someone is so kind to you, how could you not be their friend? It was like, the Rebbe calls it a Dover Nisa. There was an external reason for them to accept the Tyre. When it came to Purim, the Yidin had Nasir of Nefesh of their own choice. They decided that they were not going to denounce their Judaism. This is actually a chiddush that the Rebbe explained to the Mimer that Haman's decree was only against Yehudim. People that are Yehudim in the literal sense of Maidav, acknowledging God's oneness. If they would deny their connection to Hashem, they could have been saved. Not one Jew even had a machshava, a thought of separating himself from the Jewish people. So why was it more real by current time? Because you didn't have all these revelations. It wasn't so obvious. And that's when it's more real. It's almost similar to like anyone who after Gimel Tamas decides to internalize everything. When the gloom is not so obvious, it's more real. So you would think you would leave it at that. But the Rebbe says, no, I actually, I want to compare it to another time period. It's almost like when you have three different shades of colors, like a light blue, a medium tone blue, and a dark blue. The medium tone is light when you compare it to the darker one, but suddenly it becomes dark when you compare it to the lighter one. Purim, the time of the Gezerah, when you compare it to Matan Taira, was really real. The Jews really internalized it. But the Rebbe says there's another era. There's another era that you could compare it to. In one sense, yeah, the Yidin internalized it, it was clean stick and compared to Mount Tyre, but in another sense, it was actually very tiny stick. You know why? You know, like these stories of the of a mother who sees a car or a piano on top of her child and she gets a superhuman amount of effort and she lifts the piano and is able to take her child out. There's an adrenaline. The Rebbe explains when a Yid is in a time of the Gezerah, there's a certain adrenaline that's almost like an external force. It's almost like what happened by Matan Tyra where Hashem lifts up the mountain. It's like there's something that pops out at you, you have no choice. 
When someone comes over to you and says, when someone came over to the heathen in the time of the Inquisition in Russia and says, convert or I'll kill you or don't keep Tyre Mitzvah, there's like an adrenaline says, oh yeah? I'm gonna, I'm never gonna disconnect from Hashem. And the Rebbe says, it's actually, it's it's not your seichel, it's not your mind, it's not your personality. It actually goes against anything logical. For Chana to lose her seven sons in the time of Akka's era, for, for, I mean, the Sirius Nefesh is illogical. It goes against any of our feelings. What they went through in communist Russia, the, the fact that they sacrificed their life, that's not your kaiches, your, your everyday self. That's a dumber nice if it's like it's like you were hypnotized. Imagine someone is hypnotized and they eat a, an onion. Okay, so them eating the onion, they were under hypnosis. So the rabbi compares Azmana the Gazera is almost like we're under hypnosis. Our neshama pops out. We have this adrenaline and we and we and we do what Hashem wants. The rabbi says, you want to know what's really real, and you know what's actually if it's really real, that means it's really hard. Is not a time of Matan Tyra when Hashem is openly revealed. And it's not a time when Yidin lives under oppression and decrees because then you have extra credit help from your adrenaline, from your Etam and Hashem. The most challenging and therefore the most real time for a Yid to really want to connect to Hashem and to really want to connect to Hashem in the ultimate way with the coming of Mashiach is during a time of Har Chava during a time of plenty, during a time when our life is not in danger on a day-to-day -day basis, during a time when it's not an act of sacrifice that I have to have one time and then the person is dead, there's no seichel, there's no emotions anymore. It's every single day, taking your etzim and neshama and bringing it up and out and express in your thoughts and in your emotions. You go to work every day, Bring out your etzim and Hashem and your essence and your connection to Hashem there. You're putting your kids to sleep at night. You're in. You're you're dealing with everyday errands. That's where you're going to reveal and tap into the highest level of Hashem of Atmos. That's what Chavchas Nisan is. Do it on your own. Do it with your logic, with your talents, with your abilities. Not because of an external force. Whether the external force is Hashem revealing himself to you, you saw the light, or the external force is the adrenaline that comes from being challenged, use your internal force. Nobody's making you do this. You wake up in the morning as a, and as hard as it is, make time to connect to Hashem. You wake up in the morning with your normal, real, everyday life and yourself and your issues and your challenges and and, and everything, and in there, bring Hashem. And that's really internalizing Hashem. And that's what the Rebbe says in the Atat Sabbath. Wanting Mashiach, of course we want Mashiach so that there should not be suffering and pain. But the real reason, like Malachi Kainis, is because we, we're tapping into our essence. We want real life. We want the truth. We want everyone to see the truth. So really, it's like a, it's a, it's a totally different way of looking at Mashiach. Because it used to be the only language people had to use about Mashiach was, Ay, so many sorrows. Mashiach should just come already. Ay, Hashem should just bring Mashiach. And they were saying, no, 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 no. We're not saying, Ay, Hashem should just bring Mashiach. We're saying, you should be bringing Mashiach. We're flipping it back into ourselves. You know why? Because the way the Rebbe taught us to see Mashiach is not as something random that's going to be granted to us from heaven. It's a cumulative effort that we do. It's the same way if you do a needle point after every single stitch, after, you know, the hundreds of stitches, you will have a needle point. So after every single one of the, you know, the people that are on this call and the people we know, each of us, Elevating our inner world, bringing Mashiach in our inner world. It's like, it's like the candles being lit until the whole world is light. That's what Mashiach is. And when the Rebbe spoke about Tatat Lasser Kent, he says, like, so when are we going to be in our Gullus Prati, in Avaita Hashem? When are we going to be held up by our hiccups and our, and our things that hold us back? Free yourself. Free your Neshama. What's a Gullus Prati? A galus prati is when I, I, I don't feel connected. A galus prati is when my nefesh of Bahamas, my Yitzhahara totally takes me over. Whether it's with 
any of the four elements, right? Anger, depression, um, with boasting, anything, laziness, lack of belief, feeling burnt out. That's our to heart. Free yourself. Find that passion. And when you have a gula prati and you have a gula prati and you have a gula prati and you have a gula prati, that is cumulatively what Mashiach is. I want to end with one story. In the 1960s, there was a young boy, 12, 13 years old, by the name of Yale Butler. He lived in Pittsburgh. And his family was friendly with some of the Lubavitchers there. Now, he was a creative young boy. And he was in school and he was in seventh grade. He decided to uh, write a newsletter. And it was around firm time. So he decided he was going to do some spoof in his little newsletter. And there was a Lubavitcher in the community that wore a certain type of like leather jacket and a certain type of hat and had a certain type of beard that people in the Pittsburgh community nicknamed him Castro, like Fidel Castro. So Yale Butler writes an entire article spoofing and comparing the Slobavitcher to Fidel Castro. Now, people in the community were really upset. They said he should apologize to him, to the whole Lubavitch community. People were angry. Now, this Yale Butler was close to a Lubavitcher who said, I want to take you on a trip to the Rebbe. He brought him to New York. And he's going to have a chiddush with the Rebbe. And this older chassid, I forget his name, walked out. The Yale Butler, 12, 13 year old boy, is sitting in her room with the rabbi and he sees his newspaper on the rabbi's desk. And the rabbi didn't comment on the newspaper at all. The rabbi looks at him and told him, you should know that a talent that you have is for a reason. You're supposed to be using this talent. Hashem trusted you with this talent to inspire and unite Jews around the world. Yale yeah, breathed such a, a, like a, a breath of relief. He thought he would get screamed at just like he was screamed at by everyone else. He walked out very uplifted. Years later, he was a rabbi. He did have his own newspaper. And guess who signed up as a lifelong subscriber? M.M. M. Schneerson. The Rebbe once said about him, I know his talent from when he was a young child. The Rebbe saw the, the potential the Rebbe saw that whatever talents you were given, what does took al tvas ir can't mean? Do whatever you have to want Mashiach in a real way, which means to want your neshama to connect to Hashem in a real way, using your seichel, using your emotions, your midas, not because mommy said so, not because anyone on any Zoom said so, because you feel and know that deep down your neshama wants to do the right thing. So maybe it would have been easier if it, you would have been getting it on a silver platter. But the Rebbe was not giving us an easy job. He was turning it around and he was saying, look in the mirror at what you have. You are a graphics designer. You, you are an artist. You're a writer. You're a singer. What gifts do you have? Your home with your children. How could you elevate them? How could you and you and you and you elevate your corner of the world so that collectively, we accomplish our needle point. We accomplish our project. We are all co-owners, co-hosts of this business. Like Rabbi Mendel Commonson wrote at the end of his book, which was a brilliant line. It used to be, right? The Rebbe was giving us apes how to bring Mashiach. It used to be, we all sat around and waited for Mashiach. Today, after Chav Tess Nisan, we know that Mashiach is waiting for you. So go get on it. Go learn. Thank you, and Hatzlacha, may we all really find that fire and light that fire and internalize and feel that Geula Prati within us so that collectively we bring to the world the Geula Klaus.